so much for joining us here this morning in really quite a mild morning in Shepparton. And um, I'll give you the background as we go along, but first I think it's important that we acknowledge the um, custodians of the land that we meet on. So I think it's important to recognise that this land with all of its bountiful supply was looked after, if you like, by um, the Yorta Yorta people for tens of thousands of years. And so what we're enjoying in landscape amenity, in the bountiful fruits and the growth of animals and the wildlife and the diversity we see around us, the Yorta Yorta were part of that custodianship over a long period of time. It's really important, I think, for us as this generation to recognise that custodianship and to pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. And to recognise also, this is being recorded, so any uh, Indigenous Australians in the room or watching this um, later on, please accept my respect and, and thanks for that custodianship over a long period of time. So thank you. So again, welcome to this Norvik Foods breakfast, an opportunity to speak about I'm going to say waste, but I can guarantee you that we're going to redefine that word as we go along. You probably came expecting to see Lisa Birrell rather than myself. Lisa, it turns out, you know, with great joy, is busy doing other things today because, of course, um, husband Sam Birrell is joining Parliament today and has been inducted as National Party member for uh, the Nichols electorate. So um, Lisa's kind of busy with the family. So it's me today. I'm Greg Harper. I'm Director of Business Development and Venture in the University's Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences. So I was one of the drivers of Norvik Foods. And just very briefly, this whole concept is something that I've worked with along with my colleague Darby Laferla, picking up on things we'd seen elsewhere on Earth and, and challenging, accepting the challenge from Darby all along. Greg, don't just benchmark, go beyond what you've seen. Dream up something new. So we have this Norvik Foods venture, which we need to say is going very well, and that's in no small part due to the excellence of Lisa Birrell and, and her drive up here in the Hume region. So um, what we do, very briefly, Norvik Foods was designed as a, a way of creating deeper engagement between the University of Melbourne and the agri-food sector in the Hume region. We were supported initially by um, the Victorian government through their Victorian Higher Education State Investment Fund, a fund that was created because of the pandemic. We saw a golden opportunity, and as it's developed, we've co-invested the university with the state government and with inputs from Sensan Technologies to develop this engagement entity. It started out very much around um, bringing master's students into agri-food companies in the region, but it's evolving from there. The events we think are really important, because we've always said this is about knowledge exchange. This isn't about academic knowledge push. This is about making sure that what we're researching is relevant to the questions of the agri-food sector now and the sorts of questions that we're going to have to answer over the next 10 years. And the choice of panellists is very much about that. We've, we've been talking this morning about some of the issues that they're confronting today and will be confronting in future. And the students that we're training and engaging with, of course, have to deal with those as well. So let me just now uh, introduce the panel and then we'll get started. So firstly, I want to introduce Andrew Plunkett, who is GM for Plunkett Orchards. Also, Tim Castles, who's Digital Ag Product uh, Manager for Sensan Technologies. Also, Olympia Yaga, who's founder and CEO of GoTerra. And also, Nick Hilliard, who's Victorian State Manager for Second Bite. Now, each of these folks will give you a bit more of a chance to um, to understand their businesses and the context of waste. But let's, let's make a start now. And I think the first thing I picked up from speaking with these people this morning is that we should not be talking about waste. We should be talking about 
resources that are yet to find a home. And elsewhere on Earth, if you travelled like, like many of us have, you'll see that different nations on Earth think differently about how products and services can be recycled, upcycled, reused. If you've been to India and you've seen all of those uh, little shops that work to make sure bicycle parts continue round and round and round, you know what recycling and upcycling looks like. So each of these folks have given me a, a different perspective then on what waste means in their businesses and how we as Australians have a much bigger community role in addressing the, the challenge of unused resources. So Andrew, I might start with you um, just to give us a sense of the scale and the challenge of um, unused resources in your business. Yeah, so I guess the, um, when we think of waste, we think of the product that we make that doesn't make first grade. And there's a few parts to that. There's, there's obvious uh, waste, which is insect damaged fruit or sunburned fruit that you know, isn't fit for consumption. But the, probably the, the bigger part is what's deemed to be waste because of aesthetics or supermarket specifications or customer expectations. So it's fruit that's slightly too big or slightly bruised or a small mark. So we do have a home for that fruit as a processing grade but it's very much below the cost of production. So for us it's about trying to maximise the percentage of fruit that we grow that makes it into that first grade and part of that you know, is changing, is a perception change. There are some programs with the supermarkets to use that second grade fruit like Odd Bunch or I'm Perfect but it's at a lesser price and then one of the problems we have is that it cannibalises the sales of the class one fruit, the profitable fruit. So it's partly a solution and partly a problem. You know, we've, we've used up some of this fruit, we found a home for it, but it's cannibalising the sales of our premium fruit. Then we have, uh, we have lots of fruit that makes its way to like the second bite type um, arrangement, which is really important because there's a proportion of the society that needs to get fruit that way, because otherwise they wouldn't get fruit. And then we have a very small amount of fruit that makes its way, I guess, to, to uh, to dairy farms and uh, pig farms as just animal food, which is a, a gift, a charity. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and maybe what I'll say also is I'm going to do one round of questions uh, with the panel, but any time if somebody has a question that they, they think will be, you know, that's a real burner and needs to be answered now, will add to the contribution of the whole group, then please just put your hand up and Amber at the back there will um, bring a microphone to you. Okay, Jim, you, you heard that, and, and I'm really interested in how um, knowledge-based companies or tech companies, however you like to call it, are able to find out information about that supply and try to match it with demand of all the various forms, and we'll hear some different forms. So, so what do you see now and what do you see in the future is, is how this information will enlighten that trade. Thanks, Greg. Um, I think the end goal for everyone is well, in the in a agri production system is that knowing that yield, and if we can through the use of data, and I hate the term big data because what is big data? We've all got big data in our pocket with an iPhone or an Android phone, so the term big data in ag is just stupid. Um, but Getting to that final point of yield, if we know early enough in the season through technology, sensors, cameras, whatever it is, that what that yield in the field is going to be, that will help the supply chain from paddock to plate. Um, so if we can see that you know, there's going to be a certain amount of 50 millimetre apples or 50 millimetre plums coming through the supply chain, that will make the shed more efficient, that'll make packing more efficient, and it will, you can preempt or through data sharing and permissions of data ac um, access, the supermarket can see very early that in six weeks, eight weeks time, they're going to get a shipment of a certain quality size of fruit. Um, data privacy is a big thing in agriculture and in the world. Um, technology software has reached a point that permission-based access allows the farmer whoever's produced that data or whoever's controlling that data to, yes, I give permission to Woolworths to see my data, 
I don't like Coles, I'm not going to give permission to Coles. Not biased on Woolworths or Coles, this is the example I've used. Um, sorry. <laughs> red and green, we'll stick to red and green. Um, so the, and the technology is available and emerging rapidly. Um, there's sensor technology out there that allows for pest management. So if you can know that you've got a pest or a disease that's ready, um, or conditions are right for a mould or a fungus, you can spray ahead of that mould or fungus really affecting the fruit. If you know that a certain bug um, or a certain insect has at maturity and has laid eggs and in four weeks' time they're going to have its larvae, you can spray for that so it stops that. That technology is available now. That's available in the orchard ready tomorrow. Emerging tech, camera technology, cameras and sensors are only getting smarter and quicker and more effective. You know, there are companies that are scanning orchards to count buds, so you at, at bud set you know how many buds of fruit you're going to potentially have once the fruit gets a bit bigger, how many apples are on a tree. So, you know, in the not too distant future, you're going to be able to drive down your orchard, scan your fruit, know how many apples are on every individual tree, how many apples are therefore in the orchard, and size, colour. The next step of that is automatic picking, so a robot will pick the fruit and size it in the orchard. And, or you can thin, if you've got too much fruit, you can thin before it really becomes excessive waste, you know, and is a, is a usable apple or a wasted apple, you can thin it when it's still a little bud. So I think that technology is coming and it's only getting better, um, but there is the tech out there now to sort of improve it pre-farm gate. The, the technology is available and the data sharing is available and through permissions people sort of say we've got too much. Um, but I wonder if I could pull you up there and we'll yep. I'll come back to you on that. Okay, the sorry. Thank you. Keep Thank talking. you very much. <laughs> so digital technologies Olympia are one solution, but there's obviously biological technologies as well. And let me let me break the seal for you. Oh. We're gonna talk maggots now, right? That's true. <laughs> That's what happens when you bring a maggot farmer on a panel at breakfast. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so, look, I think what we think about is all ha about accessibility to options to valorise end of life stuff. Um, GoTerra sees itself very much working with actual wastes, not what we consider to be wasted. Um, there is a large portion of our food supply chain that is wasted um, and isn't actually waste. And so if you believe what we believe, then you believe that most of what is wasted should and must be cleaned up in better supply chains, better logistics, better you know, opportunities for valorization. And then at the end of all of that, you should find us. So we just, we just deploy robotic infrastructure that deliver food waste management as a service using insects. Um, but it's important to us that we're only managing stuff that has no other option for valorization. And I think if we're gonna talk circular economy, which I think we should, then our, when we think about waste, it should be about what and how we can use certain things and where is the best opportunity for valorization. And that's not always to shove it through a maggot. Um, sometimes it's better off and easier. So brewer's grain's a great example. That's feed. It just should go as feed. It doesn't need to be revalorized into anything else. It can just go out as feed. Um, and so I think there's a really important conversation in agriculture today around the intersection of all this ag tech startup stuff, how we apply it to leverage valorization across our supply chain and improve our bottom line. And I think when you start thinking about that way, then you can start to sort of say, okay, who's gonna give me the best opportunity to improve not only what I generally do in my core business, but create opportunity for the parts of my business that either cost me money or don't yield any value or potentially cost me money to manage. So I think that's sort of how we that's think true. about it. It's only ma mentioned maggots twice there. <laughs> it's kind of a record for me. So, so I'll come back. There's some, some interesting points raised there. So obviously we've got a complex and you know, um, diverse food system. So, so Nick, 
There, there are multiple ways that your organisation, Second Bite, brings this forward. And, and let me just acknowledge firstly the great partnership we have between the University of Melbourne and Second Bite, which is all around making, you know, particularly through the pandemic, but now continuing on, um, giving food security to our international students who went through a really difficult time and uh, in a way coming out of it, but now the relationship's built, so there's a great way that um, food is being distributed to our students to, to make them feel really comfortable. So, Nick. Yeah, so look, in a perfect world, you wouldn't need me up here. You wouldn't need me at all. Um, you know, we, we deal with it on both sides. So we're looking at obviously food insecurity for people, um, which is unfortunately a real growing problem still. Um, COVID in theory is behind us, but the need is just continually growing. Um, and look, obviously, you know, at the farm gate, there's different opportunities. We've you know, started calling it surplus. Traditionally, in our model, we talk about waste and ending waste, ending hunger. But what we see coming from farm gate isn't waste at the end of the day. Um, it is just surplus to the market's needs or what the demand is and those sorts of things. So look, we're, we're trying to you know, provide some alternatives. Like it's not going to add to your bottom line at the end of the day, but at least it can take a little bit of the sting out of you know, food that perhaps doesn't have uh, an, uh, you know, a commercial home that you can send it to and those sorts of things. So that, that's sort of the, the, the place that we fill. Um, you know, getting it somewhere where it actually makes a difference um, to someone and their, their overall you know, position and those sorts of things. So one of the things that interested me is, you know, here we are in Australia, in a region of Australia that's really focused on agri-food. A lot of what we do is about export. And I think the future for us is, you know, we already export, um, you know, high quality food products, but we also export knowledge and technology and options. So if we've agreed that food security is relatively rare issue in our community, it's certainly common in the places around us. And, and so around us, we have countries that are very keen on buying high-end food, but also uh, low-end food, high-end technology, but also practical technologies that they can plug in. So I wonder if I could get each of you to reflect on that sort of international opportunity. And I might start at the other end. Nick, what do you see as this model? Is it, is it uh, transportable internationally? Uh, look, I, I certainly think it is. There's you know, different models in different countries depending upon the, the needs and those sorts of things. But ultimately, it's, it's actually quite simple. Um, from a second bite perspective, we transport food. Um, we get it from the supply to you know, the various agencies that then go on to distribute the food. And there's, there's nothing to say that that just can't be replicated anywhere. Um, you know, in many cases, you've got a lot of smaller agencies all trying to go to the same donors. Um, which could be exhausting. You have 10 different, you know, ma and pa agencies turning up with their, you know, traditional family sedan asking for a box of this, a box of that, where someone like us can come in, do one pickup per week of a meaningful volume, and then we deal with all of the ma and pa agencies. Like here in Vic, I have 70 plus agencies come to me per week. Could you imagine them knocking on your door going, can I have a box of whatever it is that you're growing or producing? Um, you know, I can tell you how chaotic our car park is just having them come through. So that's where it could be you know, replicated literally anywhere. Thank you very much. I, guess, I think the thing, the challenge for me when you think about international exp uh, distribution of these things is the cost of fuel and transportation at this time. And so I can see, um, you know, developed world versus developing world, like that just, there's, there's an inequality there in a use case. So. You can see a use case for exporting second grade stuff to international markets in the developed world or developing sort of, so China, for example, um, or some of the Southeast Asian regions. But like if you're talking about de deploying low end things, then the cost of transport is going to outweigh the cost of goods. And at that point now, it's still charity, but by another name. Um, I don't think that solves our problem, to be fair. I think we have to actually think about distribution in a meaningful way and either the leverage of technology to empower regional capability or um, reassessing how we think about distribution for low-end products. But I, I don't know if we get to send 
our low value things overseas to countries that need it in the traditional sense because their ability to pay for it is diminished and then the cost of freight will completely blow that out. I guess what I had in mind, you know, in India I've seen Australian containerised systems for growing um, animal feeds. Yeah, so it's effectively the intellectual property or the know-how that, that we're exporting. Andrew, did you say two-thirds of your product is exported? Yeah, in a normal season for pears, it would be two-thirds. And um, what this year and the last couple of years during COVID has shown us is our vulnerability to the world supply chain. So right now, we have products suitable for export. We have customers willing to buy it, but we just can't logistically join the two dots. So whether that be shipping schedules or lack of containers or just widespread delays on a perishable, perishable product, um, you know, what we've learnt is <clears throat> how good things were in 2019 and how bad they are now. Yeah, thanks for that. So, Jim, what, what about data? You know, do you think that is there international trade in data or is it open sharing globally? What do you, how do you see this? There is uh, international trade in data. Um, there are companies who are looking at data as having value. Um, so for algorithmic learning capabilities, you know, your data has a value. Um, and so there is something in that, but also from a tech perspective, yes, there are some phenomenal companies, Australian companies that have moved overseas, um, and there are some tech companies that have come from overseas into Australia, but the markets in the US are very specific, like their almond production is huge. There are, there are tech companies that only do a niche product or a niche feature in certain industries, and I think Australia is a lot better at sort of saying, hey, we're a a bit of a jack of all trades, um, and so our software is is being exported, um, and to, you know very successfully. But it's not that niche market. They're sort of starting to find that market where people can do you know a little bit of everything. Um, and on the data side of it, you know, as data traceability and food security and food traceability comes in, you know, through connected technology, the ability to for a wholesaler in China to be able to see where that box of pears came from and potentially a picture of the tree, you know, on a QR code or something. That sort of tech and that sort of connectedness will allow the markets to see, you know, see where the food's coming from and improve the understanding. And it might be that, hey, it's come from a tree, you know, milk doesn't come from a carton at the supermarket. Um, it, and, you know, a pear comes from a tree and, you know, there's dirt, there's someone involved and that human side of, of food production, I think, through the connected ability and the data accessibility um, will, will be where the tech really sort of starts to play in it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So let me open the floor for the, for the first time. Are there questions that come up about this? David. So everybody heard the question? Yeah. So maybe I'll get each of you to comment, Olympia? So on our end, traceability is super important because we manage all types of waste streams from households to clean organics. So what we've done is create technology that is discrete. So each unit does five tonnes a day and then I can track what goes into that unit and I can track what comes out of it and where it goes. And I think um, those sorts of, te using technology in that way so that you can like literally bring down to the very micro level of like where, what, do, what were you fed, what are you, what are you now, um, is really important. So for waste with insects, well with any waste management, food, uh, waste is not waste until it leaves the source of creation. So if you can manage waste on site, you are not a waste management facility and you are not waste management infrastructure. You are just processing, right? So that first part is an opportunity currently in this existing market to leverage valorisation at the source of creation. 
The second part is, on an in if you're fascinated by insects, insects are what they eat, and so then I can define them by what they've consumed. So if they've eaten only vegetables, then that dis discerns where they then have opportunity into the supply chain, so they can then be fed to pork, poultry, aquaculture and pets. If they've been fed me meat products, they are now considered ram, and they can only be fed to poultry, aquaculture and pets. You need technology to make sure that that traceability is accurate, and that technology needs to be, and I think it's really important when you think about ag tech technology, it can't just be data. It has to, we also have to invest in infrastructure and hardware that can empower those capabilities so it can be tracked with data. So Al those Olympia, are Olympia, I might just come in with another question there. So for a lot of buyers internationally, they're after information about sustainable sourcing now. How, how do you go about addressing that matter? It's pretty boring. Um, it has a nice dashboard, but all we really do is say, <laughs> this is what we received and where we received it from and this is how far it travelled to get to us, and so we're just accounting, literally, for all of the line items. So, for example, our site at Barangaroo, which is in Tower 2 in Darling Harbour of the Lend Lease Precinct, um, that unit weighs what comes into it. It knows where that client, what client provided it, so by bin, by client, by weight, and then at the end of 12 days, I can tell Lend Lease how much each of their tenants put into the unit, and how much lava it created and how much fertiliser it created and then I can tell them where it went. And in between all of that I can tell them how, how much truck movement was required for that to happen. And so they can have a full accounting at that point from the moment a Dimeo staff member picks up a 120 litre bin and puts it in the service elevator through to when Jilamatong puts it on barley for the summer. So those are the, like, <clears throat> collecting data across those things is not hard, sorry, it is, but it isn't. <laughs> like, we have those data points, we collect them already, it's about unlocking that accessibility with good software, but again, to empower that data, you need technology that creates the proximity, the proximal ability to manage it in a decentralised way, and I think, particularly for waste, I believe that fuel costs aren't going down. I don't care if the war in Russia stops, it's not going down. And, and, and so there is a gap between today and when the fuel cells for semi-trailers are commercial and we can run them on electric. And so that to me is probably a five or six year problem that we are going to have to mitigate. And I believe the fastest way to start mitigating logistics supply chain issues is decentralisation through hardware. Thank you very much. Traceability, Andrew. Big thing for you? Yeah, it is. Well, the, the, all of our customers expect us to be able to tell us to the carton which grower that or which um, farm that fruit's come from, and that's been the case for a number of years, and that's around a food safety, um, you know, chemical residues and process. So it's a, it's a basic expectation that, that you have the ability to do that to be able to serve the customer. So, Nick, what perspective do you have on this? Yeah, so look, with traceability for us, um, it's turning more into a quality control. Uh, so we get you know, supply from hundreds of supermarkets per day, for example. Um, you know, and, and whilst our quality has improved over probably the last 18 months or so, there's still an element of, you know, you don't entirely know where each carton's come from um, with the level of clarity that we'd like. And if you don't have that accountability, people cut corners. Um, because it's just in their nature. They're in a hurry, they've got the boss breathing down their neck, so whatever they need to do to get the job done and disappeared, we'll call it, um, you know, they'll do that. Where if we, so, and this is with something we are looking at currently, is trying to get a, a better system for tracing the source. Like, it's, it's easy to trace, say, some apples that have come from Andrew. Um, I can walk into my cool room and go, they're Andrew's apples. Um, where the smaller donors, they're the ones that are much harder to consistently trace without the right technology and, and systems behind um, keeping an eye on that. Thank you very much. Jim, think something to add? Um, from a, a tech perspective or a service provider's perspective, I think every step in the production chain from paddock to, to shop has some form of tech already there. Um, and they're in their own ecosystem. So on the farm, there's great record keeping for spraying, soft, spraying softwares. In logistics, 
transport, there's great software that, you know, it's picked up from Andrew and delivered to um, a supermarket. We'll keep it political. <laughs> and so there's, but there, at the moment it's disconnected. So each one's in their own ecosystem. So providing a service that connects the dots makes it one uniformed platform and, you know, it's, it, yes, it's not data. There is hardware that is needed to be able to do that, um, I think, is where it's going to flow in. So having the, instead of having for a producer, a user, anyone in the system going, well, I need 10 apps on my phone to track this stuff, to be able to say I've got one, because they're all talking or they're all pulling the bits of information I need from all these other apps. Um, they're great in their own, by themselves and stand alone, but if you sort of connect little bits of data from all of them, you can get the start to finish picture. Um, and I think that's where the, the world and the industry needs to go. Um, you know, there's a lot of software that thinks they can do it all, but just, you know, be friendlier, be happy, open up and just sort of share a little bit of data. Um, we don't want everything, we don't want to see behind the curtains, but just enough to be able to make that and add that value. And I think, you know, it's that one plus one equals five. So, so one of the challenges I'm aware of, so I'm involved in the Sustainable Agriculture Initiative platform and their analysis globally is that there's some 400 different platforms for certification of food and ag in terms of you know, animal welfare and sourcing sustainability and, and it's not collapsed down to one system yet. So you know, the, the, the ways of getting that information to multiple and multitudinous buyers is is a real challenge for us that when we're heavily focused on export, as Andrew has said to us. So another chance, another... Say. In terms of traceability and supply chain management, when it comes to consumer safety and food safety, what does, for example, this new technology of tracing do and what has been done to ensure consumer safety Especially when it comes to the recycling of the byproduct, I wouldn't call it waste, I would call it byproduct from agriculture, from meat, from the. So, Said, I think um, absolutely. So, the, the point you're making is around in an outbreak circumstance or, or food safety generally or in the food circumstance safety of. In general. Food, food safety in general, okay. So, I might, I might start with Nick again. Nick, food safety in your business must be really important, I would have Yeah, so food safety for us is quite unique. Um, we've got quite a number of different internal guidelines which leave a lot of people scratching their heads um, because they don't necessarily understand it. Like, you know, we, for example, don't distribute cut products. And then people will sit there and argue with me, why not? I can go and buy it from the supermarket. Unfortunately, there is the possibility that someone didn't clean their knife properly before they cut that pumpkin or the watermelon. And as much as that product looks perfectly fine, we have to play it on the safe side. Now, as I said, we don't have that true traceability yet, so we can't tell that it came from supermarket X. Um, if we could, then maybe we could entertain distributing some of that stuff because we can trace it back to the source. Um, but until we reach that point, we have to stick to our guidelines. Um, protein, for example, straight in the freezer. Even if it's got six days left on it by use by or best before date, for being on the safe side of things, it goes in the freezer, it is hard frozen to reduce the level of risk of you know, you know, bacteria buildups and those sorts of things. We maintain, maintain cold chain the whole way through. Um, we temperature check, all those sorts of things. But there is still that slight potential that someone has done something silly sometime before us. So that's why you know, we visually inspect, uh, we check everything we can, and you know, the simple rule of thumb, if you wouldn't eat it yourself or feed it to your family, unfortunately, we throw stuff in the bin too. I think we, we support the, the risk frameworks we've got in Australia. I mean, we've got a great reputation for food safety, and you know, I think we need to protect that really at all costs. Olympia, are you ready? Um, so here comes the guilt trip. For, from our end, waste is contaminated. So food waste at end of life is contaminated, period. Doesn't matter if it's all separated. So we deal predominantly with food waste from retail through to households um, and everything in between. Um, and so we deal, we, you know, <clears throat> just last week we received an engine block 
some scaffolding, some corrosive oven cleaner and a 20 gallon drum, some diesel um, fluid, like an ad blue, um, and a bunch of other stuff, right? That is the true story of actual food waste. That's what, because people don't care, right? Like it's the bin. The, the bin is going away and it, it gets disappeared. We don't consider what has to be done to manage it in any form. Even our compostable recycling packaging, so those to me are largely just an exercise in sort of making us all feel better about ourselves. Like I'll keep using plastic, but apparently this one's recycling, so check for me, I don't have to change anything. It's full of PFAS. So if I'm going to use products and then process them and take the packaging off and take contamination away and then feed them to my maggots and then I, out of my process I create a 47% protein insect and I create an NPK uh, nitrogen full fertiliser. So the NPK of my product is about 421. If I make hydrolysate I can make that nitrogen a 14. So not bad, I sell it for 100 bucks a tonne. If it's full of PFAS, what have I done to you? Are you welcome? No. Is it useful to you? No. Is it even any good for mining remediation? Probably not. So thinking about how we manage waste on a transparency level and traceability level has, like, I think we kind of tend to steer away from um, acknowledging the true dynamic of the mess we've kind of got ourselves into and the things that we've decided have to be true that then impact the ability to truly move to a circular economy that is sustainable. So kind of a guilt trip but also a bit of a challenge because these are the things that I didn't know. Like when I started an insect farm I was going to just make protein and have chook farm and it's going to be a great day. And um, then I was like, shit, maggots, it's a lot like, like this is farming on its own right now. I've got to find all this food waste. And then I realised what a tonne of food waste looked like. And now I know what 10 tonnes of food waste looks like. <laughs> and now I know what 50 tonnes of food waste looks like. And it's not clean. So if we are going to process and manage these things, the, the packaging we put them in matters, the way it gets transported matters, and the way we throw it away all matters. Because if I'm going to recycle it, because... I bet everybody here could do with $100 a tonne nitrogen rich fertiliser, but I can't sell it to you if the packaging that I've depackaged it from is full of PFAS and all I've done is transfer that PFAS through to that fertiliser. So Jim, it suggests there's layers upon layers of other data that we need to keep almost continuously. You know, PFAS is one, it's a great example, but there's a whole range of other toxicants that are potentially coming through we need to be keeping track of. If we're really going to be saying to our our domestic and international buyers that this has all the qualities we're after, sustainable, safe. What's your perspective on that? Um, more data, more line items. Are, are, we, are we just going to be burning up a whole lot of coal and keeping all this data in blockchains and whatever? <laughs> you touch on blockchain. Um, yes, it's for people to really, you know, it's not like, okay, there's an element of I want to know where that apple came from. But then behind that apple, there's what's it been sprayed with, what's it been treated with, where's it been packed, where's it been cut potentially, you know. Um, that's just more and more levels of data. Um, yes, the world has become a hell of a lot more efficient in managing their data. Um, mind you, we've become more efficient in managing the data and compacting the data and storing it, um, but we're creating more. And so as we become more efficient, we're creating more, so we're sort of staying at the same level. Um, it comes back to that market need and market demand. We're not, you know, on one side you want to do less CO2 production and less of that, but on the other side you want to be able to trace everything back to the absolute minute element. Well, it's a balancing act. And it's the same with, you know, food production and food waste. It's a balancing act of having that beautiful looking tomato to not throwing everything else out. Um, so in data traceability and, and all of that stuff, it will be finding the happy medium. So Andrew, how are you positioning yourself for the expectation that there's going to be you know, consumers and buyers are going to want more and more data about your production system and the product you're producing and every aspect of it? I think it, it's, a, it's a juggling act because we want to 
give as much data as needed and have our consumers confident, but there's also the possibility of too much data. And you share too much information and then that just creates a whole lot more questions and a whole lot more rabbit holes. So, you know, often the things that aren't mentioned will be the things that the people will you'll start to mention, say, oh, well, this chemical's under the MRL, and they go, oh, why do you use that chemical? So we, it, there's a fine line in all data, I think, to say, you know, we want to have confidence from consumers, but we don't want to alarm them with certain new pieces of information that to them are new and threatening. For us, they're proven and reliable. I mean, to some extent, that's the role of regulators, right? Maybe we're a bit trusting of our governments, but we, we say that we've established certain regulations, some standards, that's what we work within, so that you know, every aspect of your business is not out there for every particular concerned consumer. It would become impossible. Exactly. I think that that's the better way at the moment so that if people can have faith in the regulators and not need to be an expert in every topic, then I think that's a better place for us than having... Maybe not, it might be nice for consumers to know exactly everything from their own research from a piece of fruit they, they buy, but I do get the odd call and I certainly wouldn't want 15 million of them a year. Thank, thanks very much. Any other questions? Or... Thanks, Saeed. Good question. So where will we begin? So GoTerra was a small business. Well, <laughs> technically still is. <laughs> um, I think, like, it's about, for, for me, it was about early collaboration. So you don't have a lot of money when you first start, and, but you see an opportunity and you can, I think a lot of us, when you sort of go, oh, I, I can see where that could go, um, but the ability to scale that when it's new idea, new technology, those things are really difficult. I think what farmers are missing out on is that there is a huge ecosystem of startups that need adoption and adopters, and they're willing to do this stuff for you um, in ways that are beneficial to both parties. And so if you're prepared to learn collaboratively with a startup, then you can actually leverage um, the education requirements and sort of the understanding. So, you know, we tried a couple of different partnerships with other startups, and some of them worked and some of them didn't, but all of them taught, and there was a lot of learning. And I think we try sometimes to learn in this more corporate way. I will buy from you, and you will provide me the service, and you will consult with me, and it's like, oh, God, I'm tired. Like, I think... And, and I've just spent more money than God and maybe I got a report at the end and that's it. Whereas when you're sort of in the dirt with somebody and you're working on something with them and you, know, you think about startups, they're like, I have an idea and I think it solves your problem. And you're like, I have a problem and I've got an idea about what solves it. Now you've got two people with a common and shared understanding of what needs to happen. And one of them has the experience and the other one has the capability. And so I think those are opportunities you can leverage really early and young that create learning, create outcomes and help steer the course. And then I think the second option that we've used for a really long time are students. So we work predominantly with um, university students at the bachelor and uh, master's degree level. We don't tend to do PhD students as often because they're quite narrow, um, but we do work with those uh, students a lot and what we've got out of that is again this hunger for knowledge people with a fresh set of eyes like I don't think I don't care who you are or what business you're in the best person to help you with your business is someone who knows nothing about your industry because what they teach you is just how much bath water you're drinking right <laughs> and and they look at what you're doing with a perspective and a passion and a, and a newness that is inspiring and encouraging and it also can actually lead you in really creative ways. Um, and they have a need to have an outcome. So they want, a, they want to improve their, their bottom line. They want to do, have a piece of work that they can leverage for their own career. So they're going to put a lot of effort into it. Um, and you, I think you know, at the end of that, what we've found is it's improved our attractability to other people. So then these people go home and share their experience with us and go, that place is a really cool place to be they're working on really cool stuff. So we may not actually hire 
the people we worked with, but we end up actually hiring quite a number of their mates. So I think those are opportunities at an entry level that businesses can leverage that often get really overlooked because we kind of think if it didn't come out of the big five, we haven't done good work um, and it's not true. Nick, I heard you say a couple of times you spoke about mum and dad sort of food distribution enterprises. I mean, they're, they're small businesses and in many cases you look at the startups that are coming, a lot of them are driven for social purpose and food is a key part of social purpose. So do you see yourself interacting with a lot more so-called mum and pop, but let's call them yeah, startups so as well? The interesting thing is some of our best relationships we have long term are small to medium. Um, reason being that we're often dealing with the person whose product it is. You know, you're proud of your product. Um, you're disappointed that it hasn't gone to market or whatever, like, you know, um, just gone avocado season, I had a new one reach out to me, never dealt with this before, they've just bought this avocado farm and they've gone, oh my God, what are we going to do with it? Um, they haven't worked out their markets yet and we've got some of the most amazing product from them uh, and she feels, you know, she messages me once a week, how many have we got this week? Um, and and they're, they're really good, useful volumes for us. Um, you know, having a wide variety of growers helps us have consistent supply. Um, you know, if we had nothing but stone fruit growers supporting us, good God, stone fruit season would terrify me. Um, and then for the rest of the year, I've got nothing. So that's where having a diverse mix uh, of different size um, producers is hugely important for us. Um, how do you get started with us? I've got business cards in my pocket if you're up. Um, otherwise, you know, just jumping on our website or just you know, giving us a call on our, our you know, freely advertised number and we see what we can work out. You know, the, at times there's geographical challenges. Um, so if you're right up the top corner near Mildura, my truck doesn't go that far. But we may be able to work out solutions with other partners to get it within range of our fleet so that we can start moving it around and getting it to where it needs to be. Thank you. Andrew, I don't think we can call Plunkett's a small to medium enterprise, but um, tell me about how you interact with the small companies that are coming to you with novel ideas or different ways of getting your product or, or your resources out to different markets. Well, for a, in the case of a sm um, smaller grower, there's a lot of growers that uh, need the help of a bigger shed, and, and there's plenty of sheds in Chapman that provide that, but I think with all of the expectations on us from so many customers, not every business can be all things to all people and they need to, uh, you know, some producers need to fall under the umbrella of someone else that'll guide them through all of those processes because it's, it's an onerous set of auditing and, you know, a new, a new entry to the uh, industry uh, taking on a farm for the first time could soon find themselves literally spending half the year preparing for audits. So they certainly don't want to do that and so, yeah, that's where uh, businesses such as ours that are packing for them can help them guide their way through all of the uh, obligations that the regulators put upon them. Thank you. Jim, Sensand is, is a scale-up of itself, but it's in this environment with lots and lots of start-ups happening in Melbourne and, and regional Victoria, and it's, it's a real energy and supported by state and federal government. I mean, ha, what trends do you see there in terms of company creation, particularly sustainable company creation? Um, I think there's there's two, I guess, ends of the spectrum. There's the company that creates a solution and they've created their own problem. So they've made a product and said, hey, look, agricultural industry, we've got this solution for this problem. And the ag industry sort of goes, oh, I didn't know that that was a problem. Um, and then there's the other side of it, which is that organic growth, which I think is where you see the sustainable companies that have been, in a lot of cases, a on-farm employee or a family farm member that's gone, I see mum and dad really struggling with X and they create a, a solution to it. Um, and there's the middle ground where these companies sort of see a problem, start to create a solution and then mine the farmer for information, for, you know, figuring out what they really, where their product fits. Um, and I think the ag industry, probably Broadacre a little bit more than horticulture, um, has had enough of that. And I think the technology space needs to work with the growers to deliver a solution. And it doesn't have to be improved yield or cash in their pocket. It can just be efficiencies. Um, and whether that's just half an hour more um, of a day to have a coffee with your wife 
um, in the morning after the school drop off or something like that. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of tech coming into the field. There's a lot of excitement coming into the field. Um, but I think it, it does boil down to how are we going to make the farmer's life easier um, and the grower's life easier or the supply chain's life easier. Um, and if you can't, within an elevator pitch, create that, give them that line item, you know, go back and reevaluate. Um, Thanks so much. Other questions? Otherwise, I'll, I'll go with another. Please. I think this is target point, Andrew, and probably back at the farm level, on when we actually tag fruits as waste. Like, is it when we put it in the bin and send it to the house? Or is it measures in the orchard to say we'll drop that on the ground or we'll thin this much? Or where, where's those, I guess, the data as well and the information to grow at, where those measures happen back in the orchard level? I guess there's three spots. It's, it's that first point, like the thinning and that type of thing, when you've got fruit there but you haven't invested much in it and you make the call to get rid of it then. Then there's the harvest point and although a piece of fruit might be usable in a processing stream, the reality is, is that the post-harvest costs won't, uh, will be greater than the value of it. So at, at picking, you drop it on the ground. And then there's the, the packing shed part of it where at packing we're determining whether it's first grade or not. And that's the worst part to be doing it because at that point you've invested a lot of money. You've harvested it, you've stored it, post-harvest treated it and you've got it on your sorting machine. So yeah, there's real, there's real potential in the future with robotic harvesting that if we could get to the point that we're only harvesting the class one and leaving that processing grade fruit on the tree, that's probably the best outcome because we're making the decision when only the growing costs have been added to it and no, no harvest or post-harvest costs. Others on the panel want to make a comment about that? So um, in the last couple of minutes, I think I'll come back to a point, Olivia actually opened the door on it, which was about labour. And one of the things that we've really been you know, learning as we go along with Norvik Foods is the, the absolute demand for, for skilled labour in the regions, in companies, in sectors, in, a, in every level. One of the things perhaps we didn't expect was that the extent to which the, um, the Norvik Foods program is starting to become a reason why students come to Australia to study at the University of Melbourne. And I know it's true in the other universities as well, we're just an example of it. So that when, when those students are seeing their opportunities for their careers, they're seeing opportunities to work in a region and through an organisation like this to get very specific training that will be valuable for them if they go back into the food industry, say in India or China, or if they decide they're wanting to work in the regions and hopefully go for uh, permanent residency. So I know labour is just a massive issue and I just wanted to give the, the panel a bit of a chance to, to reflect on the challenges of labour and um, I guess whether there are other initiatives that they um, would see as helpful. So I might start with Andrew on this one. Yeah, well, we're all aware of it at the moment, and the probably the I mean the, the biggest you know right now problem is just this tale of COVID in that we've gone through COVID okay, like we've had enough staff, but the absenteeism in the last few months and looks like for the next few is really quite extraordinary, having you know up to 20% of your workforce away each day. So. I think there's, there's a long-term need for the, you know, training up people, but, but right now we're really struggling with, you know, the short-term reality of, of what a couple of years of lockdown and, and a society that probably has less, uh, less tolerance of any, whether it be the COVID or the flu, it's certainly a difficult few months to navigate in terms of just having enough people physically uh, at work. Give me your perspective this time, because I know you're in a growth phase and finding the right people is challenging. Yeah, definitely finding the right people is challenging. Um, the, we, we work closely with, with Melbourne University and, and get um, graduates and also interns, which is great because a lot of them aren't coming from the ag sector um, and so haven't got agricultural blinkers on. Um, I know I'm, I've grown up um, in, in the ag industry and worked in the ag industry, but I'm blinkered, so, you know, I think of a product should look like this, and you get someone that's not from the ag industry, and they sort of go, well, why doesn't we do that? And you go, oh, that makes sense. Um, from the labour side of things, um, look, 
everyone's scared that you know we're not going to suddenly have the pickers picking the fruit. It's going to be robots, and that's going to you know mean that half the population of a town is going to disappear because there's not that picking force and stuff like that. It's we're a long way off having robots picking fruit. Um, yes, there are people trying to do it, but the industry will change. That's still going to have to be supported. Um, so I think the tech will improve not the efficiency of labour or the demand for labour, but it'll, it'll, they'll have to, the industry will need to adapt to emerging technologies. Um, but also, in the short term, being able to better understand the services or the, the labour services that are needed. So if we know what diseases are out there or what fruit's out there or what quantity of fruit earlier, um, you know that you know, the labour, you might be able to get your labour force in and you know, the industry or the region might be able to sort of say, okay, well look, things are really starting to come online to the east of Shepparton and so, you know, labour forces can go over there and again, that sharing of data means the employment agencies and the labour, labour forces, um, if they know where the fruit's going to be, they can sort of help manage that and sort of help support that, um, that industry moving forward. Um, so it's sort of, yeah, we're never going to get rid of labour and it's never going to be a completely automated world. data and what data can provide in knowledge. Nick, I was really surprised to hear how, how few labour are actually in your system, but, but I guess you're leveraging lots of people in a broad network, is that right? Yeah, so look, we, we, we've suffered much like Andrew with um, you know, staff shortages and those sorts of things, just as an example, for the last three months. As well as being the state manager, I've also been the warehouse supervisor, and on Thursday, I'm also the truck driver. <laughs> um, so you know, we're we're not exempt, and, you know, and this is we're, we're based in Metro, and we cannot find good people. In fact, we can't find any people half the time um, to fill some of the needs we've got. Even having such a small team, we're not looking for 20 or 30 people. We're talking ones, twos, and threes that we're trying to find. Um, so it's pr putting some real strain on our our processes. Um, but you're right, we, we don't run a big team, so. My warehouse, you know, considering the volume that we move, I've got four full-time positions in my warehouse supported by some regular volunteers. Um, the regular volunteers, you know, have been a lifesaver um, at periods because, you know, when, when the chips are down and we've got to move some stuff, um, and a lot of our products are end of life, we've got one, two, three days to move it or it's going in the bin. Um, yeah, we, we need to talk later. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not going anywhere productive from, from our perspective. Not diminishing what you do, but at the end of the day, our job's to feed people. Um, and if we're not feeding them, we're not doing our job. Um, so it, it's, it has been a real strain, and it really has been this year. Like, we, we escaped the carnage of COVID quite amazingly, to be honest. Uh, I think I said to the guys, we had two um, COVID cases over the last two years prior to the start of this year. We are getting smashed now. Um, I can't remember the first time I had a full staff. Um, I think Wednesday might be the first day, all going well, touch wood, um, that I've almost got a full staff in my warehouse in my driving fleet. Olympia, I'm sure it's a highly compelling story for people to come and work in the maggot industry, Who but how do you go? doesn't want to work with maggots all day? <laughs> yeah, look, I... I because you left me for last, I'm going to take it a different way. Like, we're, th we're the same place. I made the joke at breakfast, like, I'm the only member of the team with a reticulated licence and certainly one of only four that with a rigid. And so my investors are always sort of like, why are you in a truck again? Because, and I'm like, well, these are one of the jobs that you have to have a special piece of paper for. So um, those things are hard and I think they're... A product of the times but I think as an agricultural professional I joined the agricultural industry in 1994 um, as and I got my wool classing certificate and I started sheep and cattle um, agriculture has a retention problem and I would challenge everybody to actually think about how agriculture talks about itself as a place to work um, because there's two stories that get told right one is, come work for us, this is a lifestyle that's also an industry that's booming and it's innovative and we're doing amazing things and we're feeding Australia, which is super compelling. And the other one is, we're battlers, don't tell us how to grow your food. The new generation, particularly Gen Z, want to tell everybody how to do everything. <laughs> I've raised two of them so far. <laughs> and my mother thought I was opinionated and I 
beat her twice with what I've made. And that is a product of the world they're living in, the way we've raised them, the, the, the media that they're consuming. But what it means is the stories we tell as industries are now either doors opening or doors closing to new generations wanting to come to work for us. So we cannot paint portraits that, for those of us who've been in the industry a while, like if you tell me what ag is to me, it is two black and white, black and tan kelpies, a horse and a bunch of sheep and probably a shit ton of dust. Like that, that's the picture in my head. I've never been happier than days like that. That's where I'm the most happy. But if you're talking to this generation, they want to talk about data, they want to talk about technology, they want about creating efficiencies, they want to talk about how they can put science into their work and how they can create improved outcomes and grow better food, more sustainable food, more environmentally food, friendly food. Those are the things that they care about. If you look at the marketing data around Gen Z, 45% of them have, had, have started a business before they were 16. This is a group of kids that are entrepreneurs. They want to participate in the world and agriculture is telling them when they say, we only want to eat legumes now and we're all like, enough from you. We aren't, no, stop. Um, or we don't want you to do this kind of process that you've been doing for decades and we're like, you know nothing about how to make food, this is the most efficient way, leave us alone. And what we're doing is we're confusing our lifestyle, which is very important to us and very, and like we're, we're, we've been doing this for decades, we, our families have done this for decades and we're very proud of it and we're confusing that criticism to our lifestyle instead of the change they're asking for. And, and I say that as somebody who comes from a very tribal community in the US military and I understand what it means to be criticised for how you do life. But I would challenge everybody who works in agriculture today to think about how instead of resisting those sometimes ridiculous statements about food and how we create it and what kind of food we should create and create instead invitations to have proper discussions. Because I believe, and I know from our data and the staff that we're hiring, that there is, a, there is a horde of young people who are skilled up and ready to put their brain to work on your business because they actually care very deeply about agriculture and food, but they don't see a home for them here. Because they don't want to ride four-wheel motorbikes, they don't want to be on horses, they don't care about being dusty, and they're not particularly interested in being very in doing actual what we would consider a hard day's work. They want to do a different kind of hard day's work, and we're kind of shutting the door on them and making this place not somewhere where they would see themselves by sort of continuing to buy into that mythology of agriculture from the past. So it's kind of a little spicy, I get it, but. Um, I do think that that's something that we should consider in the workforce, outside of the inherent challenges of today, because we've got the same problems, but I think that deeper than that, you know, in 2019 we still had staffing problems in agriculture, particularly regional and rural locations. Very hard to get anyone to move from Melbourne to Canberra, let alone to Wagga or Orange or Dubbo. That's changed, they've all moved. Lots of people moving to my hometown, Cooma, that's fine, but they don't want to come out and do farm work because they don't see themselves as welcome by agriculture industry. So. Thank you. I, th I think that was a fantastic and inspirational <laughs> set of insights. But we've had uh, four great panellists. We'll draw to a close there. Four great panellists with some, some excellent insights. So I wonder if you'll join with me in thanking Andrew Plunkett from Plunkett Orchards, Jim Castles from Sensan Technologies, Olympia Yaga from GoTerra and Nick Hilliard from Second Bite. Thank you very much. You feel alive, let's hit the dance floor. Don't work too hard, my break the backbone. Return of the Mac, the king is back though. Covent and cash, I never lack.